where even our vaunted laws of nature break down, and however valid they may be in ordinary circumstances, need correction. Humans may crave absolute certainty. They may aspire to it. They may pretend, as partisans of certain religions do, to have attained it. But the history of science, by far the most successful claim to knowledge accessible to humans, teaches that the most we can hope for is successive improvement in our understanding, learning from our mistakes, an asymptotic approach to the universe, but with a proviso that absolute certainty will always elude us. We will always be mired in error. The most each generation can hope for is to reduce the error bars a little and to add to the body of data to which error bars apply. One of the great commandments of science is mistrust arguments from authority. Scientists, being primates, and thus given to dominance hierarchies, of course do not always follow this commandment. Too many such arguments have proved too painfully wrong. Authorities must prove their contentions like everybody else. This independence of science, its occasional unwillingness to accept conventional wisdom, makes it dangerous to doctrines less self-critical or with pretensions to certitude. Because science carries us toward an understanding of how the world is, rather than how we would wish it to be, its findings may not in all cases be immediately comprehensible or satisfying. It may take a little work to restructure our mindsets. Some of science is very simple. When it gets complicated, that's usually because the world is complicated, or because we're complicated. When we shy away from it because it seems too difficult, or because we've been taught so poorly, we surrender the ability to take charge of our future. We are disenfranchised. Our self-confidence erodes. But when we pass beyond the barrier, when the findings and methods of science get through to us, when we understand and put this knowledge to use, many feel deep satisfaction. This is true for everyone, but especially for children, born with a zest for knowledge, aware that they must live in a future molded by science, but so often convinced in their adolescence that science is not for them. I know personally, both from having science explained to me and from my attempts to explain it to others, how gratifying it is when we get it, when obscure terms suddenly take on meaning, when we grasp what all the fuss is about, when deep wonders are revealed. In its encounter with nature, science invariably elicits a sense of reverence and awe. The very act of understanding is a celebration of joining, merging, even if on a very modest scale, with the magnificence of the cosmos. And the cumulative worldwide build-up of knowledge over time converts science into something only a little short of a transnational, transgenerational metamind. Spirit comes from the Latin word to breathe. What we breathe is air, which is certainly matter, however thin. Despite usage to the contrary, there is no necessary implication in the word spiritual that we are talking of anything other than matter, including the matter of which the brain is made, or anything outside the realm of science. On occasion, I will feel free to use the word. Science is not only compatible with spirituality, it is a profound source of spirituality. When we recognize our place in an immensity of light years and in the passage of ages, when we grasp the intricacy, beauty and subtlety of life, then that soaring feeling, that sense of elation and humility combined, is surely spiritual. So are our emotions in the presence of great art or music or literature, or of acts of exemplary selfless courage, such as those of Mohandas Gandhi or Martin Luther King, Jr. The notion that science and spirituality are somehow mutually exclusive does a disservice to both. Science may be hard to understand. It may challenge cherished beliefs. When its products are placed at the disposal of politicians or industrialists, it may lead to weapons of mass destruction and grave threats to the environment. But one thing you have to say about it, it delivers the goods. Not every branch of science can foretell the future, paleontology can't, but many can, and with stunning accuracy. If you want to know when the next eclipse of the sun will be, you might try magicians or mystics, but you'll do much better with scientists. They will tell you where on earth to stand, when you have to be there, and whether it will be a partial eclipse, a total eclipse, or an annular eclipse. They can routinely predict a solar eclipse to the minute, a millennium in advance. You can go to the witch doctor to lift the spell that causes your pernicious anemia, or you can take vitamin B12. If you want to save your child from polio, you can pray, or you can inoculate. If you're interested in the sex of your unborn child, you can consult plumb bob danglers all you want, left right a boy, forward back a girl or maybe it's the other way around. But they'll be right, on average, only one time in two. 
If you want real accuracy, here 99% accuracy, try amniocentesis and sonograms. Try science. Think of how many religions attempt to validate themselves with prophecy. Think of how many people rely on these prophecies, however vague, however unfulfilled, to support or prop up their beliefs. Yet has there ever been a religion with the prophetic accuracy and reliability of science? There isn't a religion on the planet that doesn't long for a comparable ability, precise and repeatedly demonstrated before committed skeptics, to foretell future events. No other human institution comes close. Is this worshipping at the altar of science? Is this replacing one faith by another, equally arbitrary? In my view, not at all. The directly observed success of science is the reason I advocate its use. If something else worked better, I would advocate the something else. Does science insulate itself from philosophical criticism? Does it define itself as having a monopoly on the truth? Think again of that eclipse a thousand years in the future. Compare as many doctrines as you can think of. Note what predictions they make of the future which ones are vague, which ones are precise, and which doctrines, every one of them subject to human fallibility, have error-correcting mechanisms built in. Take account of the fact that not one of them is perfect. Then simply pick the one that in a fair comparison works, as opposed to feels, best. If different doctrines are superior in quite separate and independent fields, we are of course free to choose several, but not if they contradict one another. Far from being idolatry, this is the means by which we can distinguish the false idols from the real thing. Again, the reason science works so well is partly that built-in error-correcting machinery. There are no forbidden questions in science, no matters too sensitive or delicate to be probed, no sacred truths. That openness to new ideas, combined with the most rigorous skeptical scrutiny of all ideas, sifts the wheat from the chaff. It makes no difference how smart, august, or beloved you are. You must prove your case in the face of determined expert criticism. Diversity and debate are valued. Opinions are encouraged to contend, substantively and in depth. The British physicist Michael Faraday warned of the powerful temptation to seek for such evidence and appearances as are in the favour of our desires, and to disregard those which oppose them. We receive as friendly that which agrees with us, we resist with dislike that which opposes us whereas the very reverse is required by every dictate of common sense. Valid criticism does you a favor. Some people consider science arrogant, especially when it purports to contradict beliefs of long standing, or when it introduces bizarre concepts that seem contradictory to common sense. Like an earthquake that rattles our faith in the very ground we're standing on, challenging our accustomed beliefs, shaking the doctrines we have grown to rely upon can be profoundly disturbing. Nevertheless, I maintain that science is part and parcel humility. Scientists do not seek to impose their needs and wants on nature, but instead humbly interrogate nature and take seriously what they find. We are aware that revered scientists have been wrong. We understand human imperfection. We insist on independent and, to the extent possible, quantitative verification of proposed tenets of belief. We are constantly prodding, challenging, seeking contradictions or small persistent residual errors, proposing alternative explanations, encouraging heresy. We give our highest rewards to those who convincingly disprove established beliefs. This is one of the reasons that the organized religions do not inspire me with confidence. Which leaders of the major faiths acknowledge that their beliefs might be incomplete or erroneous and establish institutes to uncover possible doctrinal deficiencies? Beyond the test of everyday living, who is systematically testing the circumstances in which traditional religious teachings may no longer apply? It is certainly conceivable that doctrines and ethics that may have worked fairly well in patriarchal or patristic or medieval times might be thoroughly invalid in the very different world we inhabit today. What sermons even-handedly examine the God hypothesis? What rewards are religious skeptics given by the established religions? or, for that matter, social and economic skeptics by the society in which they swim. Science, Andrea notes, is forever whispering in our ears, remember, you're very new at this, you might be mistaken, you've been wrong before. Despite all the talk of humility, show me something comparable in religion. Scripture is said to be divinely inspired, a phrase with many meanings. But what if it's simply made up by fallible humans? Miracles are attested, but what if they're instead some mix of shark?